Welcome back to Hoops HD, everybody. This is our Wednesday night under the radar podcast. I'm your host, Chad Sherwood, joined by a puppet. R- Rosta Lika. <laughs> I'm joined Lika. by David Griggs and Rocco Miller. Join us from Rocketeers.org. And John, John Stalika. Stalika. We threw him off the podcast. Oh, we did? Okay. Yeah, we threw him off. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is our under the radar podcast, though. David, uh, what the hell does it mean to be under the radar? Uh, well, there's two qualifiers or two disqualifiers. One disqualifier is that you're in one of the 10 conferences that is a regular multi-bid league. That's the Power Five, which is the Big East, Big Ten, Big 12, ACC, and SEC. And it's also the five other regular bids, the Big uh, – I said the Big East already. What, which one did I leave out of the Power Conference? Well, if you know what the Power Conference is, you know it. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. I was in the, in the, I the other five, which are the, the Big East, the <laughs> A-10, the Mountain West, the West Coast, and the American – uh, so you are in one of the 22 regular one bid leagues and you are outside the top 25, which is everybody that's in those 22. leagues. Yeah. We do not include top 25 teams in the under the radar. Amazingly this season, we have not had a single team from these 22 conferences that has been the top 25. Once again, Northern Iowa is flirting with the top 25. Yale was as well, but we're going to discuss with them in a little bit. They did not yeah. uh, have a very good week last week, but uh Maybe Northern Iowa next week. I don't know. They'll probably not. They'll find a way to lose a game. Probably so. Uh, but what we like to do is go through all these conferences in alphabetical order. But we start with a feature conference, and we try to switch it up every week. And I've got a conference we have not discussed really all season. It's a conference that we go through these leagues in alphabetical order. It's one of the last ones we get to. So uh, not the last, but towards the end. And so we kind of have been brushing past it a little bit. Uh, not quite the league it's been the last few years, especially with their star player gone that was that was there. But I the, definitely know what it is. Bring on the summit. There is the summit league. Yes, uh, we have not discussed it much, but really, Rocco, let me bring you in here. Really fascinating standings now, right now, with the one game separating the top three teams here: North Dakota State, a perennial power; South Dakota State, who uh, lost their star player, and South Dakota up there mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, uh, it's been a fascinating race. I think uh, not as much was expected from South Dakota State with not only Jenkins leaving, but also following Coach Otts to UNLV. Uh, Jenkins sitting this year out over there. But uh, they've been able to bounce back nicely. They've promoted their head assistant coach, uh, and they've really brought it together here during conference play. North Dakota State, of course, last year came on strong at the end of the year to win the bid and gave Duke that epic uh, scare in the first round of the NCAAs. So we, I think we all largely thought North Dakota State would be the odds-on favorite. But we knew Omaha had a tough team coming back. Uh, Oral Roberts had some really good young players last year. So it's been a really fun top five here uh, across the board. And at this point, North Dakota State's won five straight. South Dakota State's won four straight. And I think we're on a really good collision course for the top five in, in uh, Sioux Falls uh, later uh, in early March. Yeah, and, and everybody's battling here, David, to see who wears white in the conference tournament. Although right. with South Dakota and South Dakota State, they're both uh, they're both the home state teams here, so uh, yeah. they can claim home court advantage, I guess, here at least over the other teams. Right, and uh, y- you know we we obviously like it when the conference tournaments aren't at a predetermined site, but still something to play for here. As you you know, as Rocco alluded to, we're starting to see, see separation between the Yotes, South Dakota State, and North Dakota State, and whoever finishes first first should have a decidedly easier path to the championship game. If you notice, there those are the only three teams with overall winning records. So like. You know, to avo- to be able to avoid one of the other th- big three, so to speak, in the semifinals should be an advantage. W- what's interesting about this league is that it feels different this year, but why does it feel different? I'm not really sure. Maybe the star power is gone. Cause maybe, maybe because Mike Dawson's, not, maybe Mike Dawson's not in the league. I think that helps a little bit and not yeah. be what it was last year. But Yeah, uh, but the front runners are still the front runners. It's still the, the North Dakota State, South Dakota State. Or, 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 you know, like they are most years uh, in first place. And like it is seemingly every year, Denver is in last. <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you the other interesting thing, though, about finishing first place, you are likely headed towards, I mean, maybe it'll be Denver, but probably Western Illinois. The eighth, one team does not even make the conference serve. The other team will be the eighth place finisher for your quarterfinal. If you finish in second place, you're going to get a lot tougher team than <laughs> yeah. one of this group here of Omaha, Oral Roberts, Fort Wayne, North Dakota, who have been competitive all season, at least. 
Yeah, a good observation. Uh, so, you know, you, you'll have a lot easier path. path. I mean, I'm not saying the two seeds necessarily going to lose in the conference tournament, but they may have a lot tougher battle with that quarterfinal game. So that's the other very small advantage. You don't get home games, but you get a small advantage. Uh, yeah. You should have if things went worked right and how often they work right is very rare. Um, but uh, we should have yeah. the upcoming games coming up on the schedule on the screen here. Uh, we see North Dakota State and South Dakota State with home games on Friday, actually a rare Friday night in the Summit League uh, coming up this week. That's a little bit of a, something different that we don't normally see. Yeah. Uh, maybe circle the game next Wednesday, North Oof. Dakota State at South Dakota among two of the top three teams here. Yeah, a big one. If things hold serve like we think they will, that will be that will have first place implications. And as Chad just mentioned, uh, he normally doesn't make good points, but he just made one. That is, you, you know, kind of a, an advantage at getting to play either Denver or Western Illinois. Yeah, um, it is. But let's not forget what happened last year. Uh, Mike Dom, dominant South Dakota State team, lost to a four and twelve Western Illinois game in that yep. one eight game. It was an amazing overtime win for the Leathernecks. Yeah, the Leathernecks, a great, uh, you, you know, Summit League Conference Tournament team and awful regular Caesar team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they, they've, done some, they've, yeah, they've made some they've noise some here. stuff before. Yeah. Yeah, they've, made some, they've made some non-conference noise as well. They just do really, really lousy during <laughs> yeah. Summit League regular season play. Didn't they beat Wisconsin um, a couple of years back? In the, yeah, they did. Yeah, and and right. since it's the feature conference, we could, I remember the year Oral Roberts was hovering around the bubble and it was all said and done. Uh, they were within the next four out. Uh, Western Illinois or Western Illinois knocked them out of that tournament in the quarterfinals. Had that not happened, I bet Or Roberts would have been inside the bubble. I don't know if you remember that you year. We go back a few year. years, David. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you're showing your age. I, I do vaguely remember that. Yeah, I got to get the year. We'll yeah, get back, back in it, back in aught three. Uh, yeah, um. with Oral Roberts. Yeah, <laughs> I think that was before Oral Roberts went to the Southland and then came back. You're right. They did go to I the South and come back. Uh, that's true. Yeah. Uh, let's let's go through the rest of the conferences as we are going way way back in time now. Uh, let's let's go back to the conferences that are going on this season and and you know alphabetical order. Let's start in the America East where uh, Rocco um, Vermont picked up a win tonight fairly easily at home against New Hampshire. Also won at Hartford over the weekend. All be it the Hartford gave them a heck of a battle, but now ten and one in conference play, and this team is just looking better and better every day. Yeah, so I think after tonight's win, that gives them a total of 10 in a row, uh, maybe maybe even 11. So, they, yeah, they're rolling after that that game where they were stunned at home against Stony Brook, uh, which is a, a segue of sorts because they will get that back, back end of the Stony Brook game on the road uh, in a week. Um, but, yeah, Vermont definitely becoming the team that we thought they would be. I don't think they get too test, terribly tested in this league. If you look at this 10-11 game winning streak, they haven't played anybody in the top 200. Uh, so it's really kind of hard to size them up against a team that they'll play in the tournament. But, of course, with the confidence high and getting, uh, you know, the team meshing at the right time, that's only going to bode well. Yes, it won't be until next Thursday. That's why it wasn't on the screen there. But uh, they got big yeah, into it home this weekend. Uh, so we'll have one more under the radar show before we get to that next Vermont Stony Brook game at Stony Brook. Yeah. And right, if it they is win, a 10-game winning streak now. Right. And if they win that one, it's it's theirs. They, they've got a two-game lead with, I think, you, you know, five games to go. By that point, they will have a three-game lead, plus they would have beaten them twice. So even if they lose out and Stony Brook wins out, if we're, essentially if Vermont wins the next two, home court advantage is theirs, if my math is right. Yeah, it is. And, uh, yeah. you know, we being at home, winning Stony Brook. Uh, even if they don't win at Stony Brook, they should still have it with uh, UMBC and Albany at home uh, game at Lowell. Uh, yeah. They're, they're just – I think their head and shoulders better than the rest of this conference at the moment. And yeah. the only thing that's going to be interesting is probably going to be a Stony Brook at Vermont America East championship game. Yeah, so pretty, Stony pretty Brook much. gave past a, a Hartford team that has a little bit of life in them, but they will get, yeah. uh, probably get that game at home. Right. Uh, the A Sun conference Liberty is a team that, you know, had that real head scratcher of a week, but it continues to bounce back. David had a win at Jacksonville had a win at North Alabama by fairly easy fashion over the past week. Yeah. Um, the thing is, well, with the two conferences losses, I can't talk right now. Two conference losses <laughs> still in the tie with North Florida. And that is significant because one of the losses was at North Florida. So while they clearly look like the best team, the way this tournament plays out with campus sites, if they do not beat North Florida in the second game, 
they have to go there uh, for the championship game potentially, even more potentially than likely. And as we saw, that was that is not going to be an easy game for them to win. So as good as they are, you, you know, um, they're still not in the woods for getting the play at home all the way through. Yeah, and it is coming up on again next Thursday. So I'll have one more show before that, Rocco. But yeah. uh, they are hosting North Florida next Thursday. Must win game, and and obviously they'll put them a game up in the loss column. So if they can win out, which quite honestly they should be able to do, their road games are at a very very bad Kennesaw team and yeah. a very weak Lipscomb team. That, that team that was good last year, but is not the team they were last year at Lipscomb. Yeah. Uh, this team should be able to win out, win these three home games, win the two road games. Then they are the one seed and get the host of the conference tournament. Yes, yeah, so I think Liberty is kind of a double-edged sword because uh, they they play kind of a slow down, methodical, really good shooting, uh, spread the floor type of team. They want to take the air out of the ball, if you will. But that allows teams in the Atlantic Sun to kind of hang with them, as we've seen in the two losses. And even in a couple of their narrower wins, I think they won by nine in one of their games last week. Um, but the upside there for Flames fans and, and people that follow Liberty is if they can get out of this league like they should and get to the tournament, we all saw what they could do in the NCAAs last year because that is about the formula you need to pull off an upset against a four or a five seed in the NCAAs. So yeah. I, think, I, think, I think it's a really interesting case study because North Florida could beat them in a one-game scenario, but as long as Liberty gets into the field, they're going to be one of your uh, potential upset picks in your bracket. Right. I, and I realize we got to get moving, but to, to talk about Liberty a little bit more, this was a team that made the round of 32 last year, but even before winning that NCAA tournament game, you may recall that during the year, Liberty, yeah. or, excuse me, like uh, Lipscomb was really good. They, mm-hmm. they went there and won. There were times during the year where they looked like an NCAA tournament caliber team this year despite being 21 and three against D one competition, I haven't seen it, even though it's the same roster, they don't seem as good. Is well, that well, just, well, yeah. well probably one of the facts about it is they may yeah. have 21 D one games, but 17 of them were against yeah. David, the bottom of the barrel of D one. This is a <laughs> pathetically bad 303 ranked strength of schedule for the flames. I, yeah. the team, I mean, you got to fault them for scheduling like that off of a round of 32 with most of the team back. I, right. I and mean, in, in, even in the, their tests, like I know it's hard to win at LSU, but they lost by 17. And a few other teams have won at LSU. Yeah. And I mean, in that game, they did. It's not that they lost, but they didn't look like an NCAA tournament team in that game. They certainly didn't in a lot of their other games too. Yeah. So, no, I, I, I've even been, their win at Vanderbilt was rather unspectacular. I tell you, there's nothing I've seen in this Liberty team this team this year, despite the 23 and three overall record, that tells me that they can get out of the round of 64 this year. Yeah, yeah, and I, I really just think it goes back to their style of play. It lets mm-hmm. teams that are much lower level to hang with them, but it also gives them the ability to take the air out of the ball against better teams. So it's interesting. Yeah. Oh, well, it may come down to the matchup again. Uh, really, who do yeah, they play in that always. first round? Yeah, um, always. Yep. Rocco, you are our West Coast guy, so let's head out to the Big Sky Conference now yes. where we've been going back and forth with this kind of three teams, really, Montana, Eastern Washington, and Northern Colorado. For today, at least, Montana half game lead in the conference standings. Yeah, Montana half game lead after their big 92-89 win in Cheney uh, over the last week. Um, that gave them control back in the, in the standings. I think um, – you know, the, the top three here are pretty solid. The really interesting one is Northern Colorado, who uh, may not be in first at this point in time, but they are within now the top 100 of Ken Palm. They're at, I think, 96th overall in Ken Palm. So I got the 95 right there, yep. Yeah, so they're clearly – about 78 in the BPI. How, that's a hell really? of a number. Yeah, yeah so I, I've really started to pay attention to them a lot closer the last couple of weeks. Those numbers really jump off the page. Uh, a capable team with some good athletes. Um, so I think it's kind of anybody's ball game. Weber State's another team that started in the basement this year. Uh, Jarek Harding might be the best player in the entire conference. He was out for the first, um, I want to say, three or four weeks of conference play. He's back, and he's putting up astronomical numbers. And we've got a rematch now of Weber State and Montana coming this week, not to steal the, 
next page. There it is, right there. Yeah. yeah. So, so Weber State's a team you got to keep your eye on, and Northern Arizona, uh, a much improved team. So, it's there's some cool stories happening here. Yeah, I mean yeah, that I, Weber State team could pro- could maybe even you know with a few more wins, you get to maybe I don't know if they get the top three, but maybe fourth place, uh, have a winnable quarterfinal round game, get the get the buy past the first round of the conference tournament, and be real dangerous uh, come the semifinals and championship game of this tournament. Probably so. Uh, another good story, and, and I realize we got to get moving, but Southern Utah, while not contending for to win the league, having one of their best years really in recent memory, especially after recently winning the, the Centenary Award, and you look at their schedule coming up, they're going to Sacramento State, which is, you know, very, very <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> we, 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 I've, I've just been half a second on Sacramento State. Sacramento State, I believe, got up to their best D1 start ever. Uh, this team in the last three weeks looks like they've completely given up on playing basketball. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, 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 uh, you know, it's real, it's kind of, yeah, like they're, they're getting ready to host the NCAA tournament. Are they the host? Team? I, think they, uh, I know it's the yeah, host. I believe city. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, I mean, that. yeah, you know, maybe, maybe someday consider <laughs> trying to play in it, but uh, <laughs> you, you know, no, I, Southern Utah, I mean, I mean, this is, and I don't mean this as a backhanded compliment. This program has made very big strides this year. No, no, yeah, this definitely team is definitely in there. I, I agree. I don't think they're an NCAA tournament team, but yeah, they're, they're going to be right in contention for at least to to wear white in the in the yeah. and maybe get a buy through the first uh, first round of the Big Sky tournament here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Big South Conference, David. We've got Winthrop, who finally suffered their first conference loss, and after they went and they won at Radford, we were singing their praises, and. Then they hosted Radford, and while you see an 81-77 Radford win, uh, Radford completely kicked their asses in their game. It wasn't – but for a late late run, it was that close. Yeah, like it, it was – the margin was over 20 at one point. I want to say – I don't remember what it was with 10 minutes to go, but it felt like it was way in hand. And then, and then like, Winthrop went out of their mind, and, and you just wonder where was this for the first 30 minutes of the game. And I think they got – did they tie it? Or they got – they either tied it or they had the ball. They had the ball, I think, to to d- down two or down three. They did yeah. have a chance. Yeah. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, because at this point, like, you just kind of written it off as a loss. So I don't know how to feel. Like, I mean, yeah, it's an impressive win for Radford, but part of me's very, very impressed with how Winthrop was able to come back like that, even though they didn't win. Uh, what it means is that, it, you know, with five games to go, they got a one-game lead. It was a two-game swing had they won it. We're in a situation where they're two games away from clinching home court, but Radford right back in this race and Winthrop really for the first time looking a little bit vulnerable. They go to Gardner Webb this week, which, you know, they should win, but yeah, yeah, but not the easiest place with two road games coming up. If they stumble in one of those, Radford could catch them. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Rocco, what what do you think? I mean, uh, I'm not certain what it would come down to if the two teams finish tied. And, um, that would we have to go deep into the Big South tiebreakers to see who gets the one seed. <laughs> but it's big because the home yeah. team hosts the quarterfinals and yeah. semifinal rounds, and the highest remaining seed will host the championship game in this tournament. Very important. I mean, and it's really just down to these two dogs left in the race. So, uh, and Winthrop, you know, in that box score, if you pull it up, they've got – they took 35 three-pointers and only 28 two-pointers. So Winthrop is um, an impressive story to, to have a 14-game winning streak and be that dependent on threes. They've, they've got some un, uh, unbalanced amount of three-point attempts that they rely on. You would think at some point they'll go cold, but I think that does maybe make them more vulnerable for an upset down the stretch as the regular season closes out. So something to keep your eye on. Um, it really kind of bit them in that first half when Radford built a big lead. Um, but, yeah, so I think that's going to come into play. One other note here in the Big South, I don't, I don't know if it was mentioned yet, but Juan Perez is Gardner Webb's leading scorer, best player, is no longer on the team. Um, and interestingly, the two games they've played without him, they won them both. So <laughs> could be a little Ewing theory here. Yeah, it was uh, addition by subtraction here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Rocco, let me stick with you. We'll go back out to the West Coast there where yeah. uh, UC Irvine has a one-game lead, one-and-a-half game lead, I guess, on on the – Bows there in the Big West. Uh, I know we've got a few games coming up. We are recording this around uh, 9.30 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday evening. There's a few games coming up tonight, including uh, Irvine at Riverside and the world-famous Rivervine Cup, as well as Long Beach at Hawaii tonight. later on tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, UCSB ended uh, Irvine's hot streak over, uh, I think that was last Thursday night. Uh, I was a little dis... Actually, that was Saturday. Well, that's Saturday, after they won't beat Hawaii yeah. on Thursday. Big yeah, so it was a big... Big week for the Gauchos, exactly. So I was 
I was hoping to get down there for the Thursday game. Didn't work out, but uh, I did follow the games. And um, the Gauchos do have a good roster. Still in the hunt for uh, winning this league in the tournament, at least. And, you know, this week coming up, we got Irvine going to Hawaii after River uh, after the Rivervine Cup. So um, another big <laughs> – <laughs> it's another big week, week for Irvine. Um, Riverside, they had a promising start. They've been kind of falling off lately. We'll see if they have any life left tonight. If they can't come out and get excited for tonight's game, I think they might be. It might be time to write them off. I'll tell you what. So with 14 wins already overall, um, I'm not sure. I didn't do the research, but this may be their best D1 season ever, or has a real good chance close, to be. Yeah, it's close. Yeah, uh, David. Beyond the Big West, let's let's run over to the Colonial Athletic Association. Yeah, fun, I mean, uh, again, this, we this conference we, we t- it has been. It was our feature conference of uh, three or four weeks back, and it's we said that we thought it would be fun, and it really has been. And uh, as of today, and the lost common least Hofstra by a game. Yeah, Hofstra, the preseason favorite, who you, you know does have some head scratching losses, but been <laughs> every time I'm ready to sing their praises and think that they're going to run away from the league and and put together like a you know the caliber a team that could really put up a good fight in the round of 64 if they could get there, they seem to lose one, but. I, you know, them and College of Charleston have been playing really well lately. Um, you know, Charleston, they did. I say that they did. They, you know, prior they, to, oh, College Charleston lost at home to Elon over the weekend. Yeah, prior to uh, that, Elon, they, Elon's yeah. nine seventeen. David, don't don't yeah. tell me Charles. Now they beat William and Mary at home. Well, yeah, that was Thursday. the thing. I mean, they they, <laughs> they they beat William and Mary, and then they lose at home to Elon. It, it was kind of. You, you know, mind-numbingly. Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, but, William and Mary heading the wrong way had a great start to the season. Lost yeah. to Dave Charleston, lost to a Wilmington team that yeah. has been playing re- better since the coaching change. Uh, still one of the right. worst teams in the conference. So uh, uh, and, this whole league kind of hard to figure. You know, William and Mary prior to that was was tied for first place, and Charleston didn't just beat them; they just murdered them. I, I mean, I, yeah, I, the, th- and, the final score was I think eighteen, but it was more than that it mm-hmm. seemed and uh y- y- you know and then they follow that up so again this is a league where, where teams i think several of them have a high ceiling but they also sometimes can't get out of their own way yeah Go ahead. yeah and how, how about a team that's won six in a row the delaware blue hens they, they, they uh, had that great non-conference this season remember they won the, they were undefeated for, i think through like 10 games or so all being against garbage competition yeah suddenly really playing well rocco and you know Two yeah. road games, or two winnable road games coming up this week too. Elon and uh, William and Mary. Absolutely, and El- Elon, you, you got to watch out. They've won three in a row themselves. They've got a transfer that I'm very familiar with from the Pac-12, Marcus <laughs> Sheffield, who started for Stanford the last three years. He put up 31 on Charleston and put put the Phoenix on his back to win that game down in Charleston. Now, you know, Elon has been really an afterthought. Probably the first time we've talked about him this season. Um, who knows? And maybe I mean, the last I mean, time. <laughs> okay, well, good. until the, uh, you, you know, until the Colonial. Yeah, until we discussed their loss of the 8-9 game. You know. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm just saying they've got a Pac-12 caliber player that's really getting hot, and uh, they might be a team to just keep your eye on. I don't know if they can win the whole CAA tournament, but uh, playing well at potentially the right time. And obviously, a really fascinating. We got you for College of Charleston at Hofstra, yeah, uh, coming on Thursday night at Northeastern on Saturday. Northeastern yeah. team that's been disappointing, I think yes, overall, right. but but still is a very tough team and, and always a good coach. Boston. Yeah, C of C, uh, they'll probably go to Hofstra and win by like fifteen, and then they'll lose to Northeastern. <laughs> probably, probably lose by thirty to Northeastern. Y- yeah. Uh, Hofstra USA. Brock, we we see, uh, I'm sorry with this. Here. We see a couple of colors here on the screen. Um, uh, yeah. There are the there's the pod system here, and there's still two more games before it. But North Texas and Western Kentucky have both clinched pod one out of three pods. Uh, Middle Tennessee, way down the bottom, has clinched pod four. What this means is the top five teams uh, will play each other in games that will be announced here on coming up probably on Saturday night or Sunday morning uh, in the, for their final four regular season games. Teams that finish 6th through 10th will play each other. Uh, four games, one, two home, two road against everybody. And 11th through 14th will play each other, two home, two road games for each of these teams. Mm-hmm. So that's what the pod system is in Conference USA. It's a little bit complicated, but at the end of the day, what it means, if you finish in pod one, will you, be, you will be guaranteed one of the top five spots at least in the conference tournament, as well as having these 
tough five final uh, games here for the conference regular season. Uh, Louisiana Tech, Florida's National, Charlotte, Rocco, right there on the verge, should be the top five teams, though, along with uh, the Mean Green and the Hilltoppers there. I'm really glad that you put the, uh, the whole thing together here in the sheet. makes it very clear yeah. for the audience. Um, I, I was starting to do some of this research earlier. So uh, I think La Tech's about as safe as you can get. They have two home games this week. But I do think maybe a tiny bit of risk for Charlotte or FIU going on the road twice. You never know. They could get swept on the road. That could open the door. Uh, but that would require one of the teams two games back to also sweep. So uh, more likely than not, we're going to end up with these five in the top pod. I know this isn't the most popular thing for every single fan out there, but I personally love it. <laughs> I, just, I, <laughs> I, I like it too. I, I love all the unpredictability and the, and then all of a sudden the schedule just changes, you know, right after Saturday. I, I'm really looking forward to waking up Sunday and seeing where everybody's going. Um, right. So I, I'm, I'm, I like this time of year. And very, very of minor, just maybe to nobody other than us though here, uh, you know, the bottom pod here uh, is games that nobody's going to actually be watching, but only two of those four teams will make the conference tournament. So if it ends up these four, or yeah. you know, maybe somebody jumps up and one of these other five yeah. and seven teams fall down. But uh, Middle Tennessee not looking like they're going to make the conference tournament right now. Southern Miss probably going to have to win not only these two this week, but a few more beyond that as well. Right, and the uh, the survival board will be all over this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... But yeah, it should be interesting. It should be fun in terms of this these final few games here. A uh, couple games to look at here: uh, Florida Atlantic at Louisiana Tech. Maybe is a game worth watching. Um, there's a few games worth watching here, probably. But it'd be really interesting to see where the pods play out, and and especially these pod one games over the final four games of the last two weeks should be a lot of fun games because we will have these top five teams playing each other. Uh, yeah. And one of the things I'd like to – we have the curtain, and, um, you know, we eliminate the last two teams. I would be in favor, Chad, of just eliminating one of them and then having a 13-team tournament because you know what that would create? An opening round quintuple header. Uh, the curtain, for those of you that don't know, David, uh, is is the Conference USA actually plays multiple games simultaneously in their conference tournament in the same building with a <laughs> yeah. big giant curtain between them. We absolutely love it. It is the, yeah, it, it, it's, it's better the than best a double header. Tournament quite, you can go to because people are just walking back and forth between the two games. Yes, yes. You buy a ticket, you can go to either game. You can walk back and forth. Once a <laughs> block, you go to the other. Uh, David Horizon League right state continues to maintain a one game lead, although they did lose Northern Kentucky. So when the two teams play again, and KU has a chance to control their own destiny for the number one. I, I thought they destroyed Northern Kentucky. Did I get it wrong? Yeah, okay. like, like Wright State yeah, Blue, they, they lost yeah. to. Uh, okay, they, they well, they lost to Green Bay and somebody yeah. else. Yeah. Well, if Wright State loses an extra game and loses Northern Kentucky again, then yeah. Okay, okay but Go yeah, ahead. well, I mean, again, if they if they uh, it, it actually is no small who I I forget who all, but if the two end up tied, I believe the tiebreaker is the the team that like. Uh, it, you just go down the list and like if did both teams sweep the third place team did both teams sweep the fourth well, place a, and it's it's up for grab who the third place fourth place fifth place it, right be right now so so northern be- kentucky right in there uh now the other thing is that this is at a predetermined site it's not anything is like it used to be when it was cool and they would sell out the tournament games but um yeah like right state holding on uh for now i but this is a good team. I mean, they've won a lot of games. We've watched them all year, and they haven't really buried teams with the exception of that one game against NKU. So you start to wonder, like, what is their ceiling, and are they sort of overachieving when, while they're winning, it's not by big margins against teams that, quite frankly, are pretty bad outside of NKU. Let's pull up the right state profile here, and maybe there's the question, Rocco, is can this right state team – win a game in the NCAA tournament, assuming that they are able to uh, go to Indianapolis and win a pair of games. They will get a buy into the semifinals. The top two teams will, but if they can win a pair of games in Indianapolis, can they, how far can they go? Yeah. I, I don't know if I'm sold. I think, I think they've played very well in the horizon league, uh, but they didn't have any games. I don't think they played a quad one or quad two game at all this year. They did. Uh, the and... toughest game was probably at Toledo non-conference. <laughs> I mean, yeah. But look, at that, a... look at that three twenty two non-conference strength of schedule. Pathetic. But, then, <laughs> right. but, but you look at the five losses though. Here's the, here's on the flip side of that argument. Mm-hmm. Look at these losses. They're all like razor thin losses An OT loss to Indiana state is their biggest margin loss. 
Everything yeah. else was a one possession loss or UIC was a four point loss. So yeah. uh, it's clearly hard to blow them out. Nobody's done that. So yeah, I could see them hanging, hanging around with anybody. Based on yeah. That. And if you look at it and these are sub 200 te- I mean, these are teams mm-hmm. that are not playing in anywhere and you look and it's just, you know, a six point win at home against green Bay, a five point win against Milwaukee, a five point win against Miami, Ohio, a one point win yeah. against Detroit. I, I mean, this is not like when you watch them while they're winning, I don't, and I like what they've done not to d- dismantle them, but like, when you watch them, you don't think, man, that's a team that could win a game in the round of 64 if they get there. So in other words, yeah, to make it the final I mean, four, that's what you guys are yeah. telling me. Well, they might, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they've got some good experience with Loud Love and Wampler and Cole Gentry. Those guys yeah. are really fun to watch and have been around a long time. But, yeah, I, I don't know. There's no proof in the pudding at this point. Yeah. Right. Let's go to a team that actually can make some noise, I think, yeah, in the can. round of 64 if they win this conference tournament. They've got to do it at Harvard. Uh, Yale – and Princeton currently tied out. Yale hosted Harvard, Rocco, over the weekend, and mm-hmm. I was really shocked. I thought this Yale team was so good and playing so well, mm-hmm. and to lose at home to a Harvard team that had come off an 0-2 week the week before, or two weeks before with Penn and losing Penn and Princeton, uh, yeah. just shocked me. And uh, I'm quite honestly, look at the standings right now, Harvard wouldn't be even in their own conference tournament at the moment. <laughs> yeah. These standings hold up. Yeah, what an adventurous weekend it was for, the, for Harvard, in fact. You know, uh, the, the way that Yale-Harvard game ended, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about it. Oh, yeah, uh, it was crazy. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yale uh, guard gets fouled on a three, ball goes in, he gets a free throw. I think about, I don't know how much time went on before he actually got to shoot the free throw. It might have been six or seven minutes with the yeah. replays and the timeouts. About three hours, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. yeah. So by the time he finally shot it, it barely even got iron. I mean, he had no legs in that free throw. It was really a crazy uh, ending. But Harvard survived. But then, of course, they go the next night and take on the Ocean State champions and get beat by Brown. And, and, and a very yeah. similar ending to that, that there was a, there was a foul yeah. late in that game that gave, but Brown actually hit their free throws as opposed yeah. to Yale uh, to get that win. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, so now the Ocean State champs have four straight wins, and um, Yale bounced back with the win the next day. So, you know, I think overall um, Yale is certainly the team to beat. They've got a tremendous front line. Another thing that happened in that Harvard game uh, that I guess I didn't realize until the next night was Jordan Bruner is one of their better players uh, big men. He went down with a knee injury about five minutes ago, and he didn't play the next day. So that's definitely something to monitor for Yale. Could really hurt their rotation if he's out long term. Yeah, I mean they took care of Dartmouth the next day, but meanwhile, uh, yeah. Princeton uh, lost to Cornell, jumped back with a win at Columbia, but uh, actually now is sitting here five and one in conference, tied with Yale. Uh, I, I'm not a believer in this Princeton team, David. I don't know if you are, but not particularly. Uh, but we will uh, find we will find out on Friday exactly how good Princeton is. They are they are hosting Yale on Friday night. Yeah, I I, I, I think I know how that one's going to come. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it'll be interesting to see here who only four teams make the conference tournament here. Does Harvard bounce back? Uh, can Brown keep up their success early on? Uh, you know, yeah, so- well they're already in, aren't they? The Ocean State. Tournament. They're in the NCAA tournament. I think. Oh, okay. I think that's, that's an automatic that, bid. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're still trying to confirm that. We'll have to call Mark Emmer and find You're out. Right. Yeah. He's busy testifying for the Congress this week, though. Uh, uh, this is our, our feature conference last week with Metro Atlantic. We featured it because there was eight teams within two games of first place. We should have waited another week. We now have ten teams within two games of first place <laughs> yeah. in the Metro Atlantic. It How is that even mathematically possible? Standings I've ever seen in my life. Uh, in the lost column from eight and five. Ryder and St. Peter's all the way down to five, the three, five, and seven teams there. Everybody can win this conference, maybe other than Canisius at this point. Uh, Dave, right. uh, I, 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 this is going to be crazy. Uh, and my yeah. credential just came through to go to the Metro Atlantic Tournament. I'll probably be there for a good number of the games at least. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Ryder, a team that we were big on for a while but then kind of disappointed, has been bouncing back, you know, a couple close wins this week. And how about Iona, who we all know is going to win the conference tournament, even if they finish eighth or ninth. How about them getting hot all of a sudden? Uh, real hot. They, they won at Quinnipiac. They won at Fairfield. A pair of road wins. Uh, uh, why not, Ryder? Why not, Rocco? Why not Iona to win this conference tournament? 
Why not? I mean, I think I think the league in general, the the note I wrote down about it is you can't trust any of these teams. If you can trust one at this time of year, it is Iona. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I mean, I certainly don't trust Ryder. I don't, can't tell you how many times I thought for sure they were going to want run away this year, last year, other years, and and they let you down every time. You think they're going to take it away. So we'll see how they how they fall apart this time. Yeah, um, but yeah. Oh, sorry. But you, you are absolutely right, Rocco. And then Iona, if you watch those games, they went on the road and just blasted them, right. you, you know, all week long. And it's like whatever they were missing, they have their stride now. Well, yeah, they it's, are, it's, 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 we've seen this movie before. Yeah. Uh, Circles Gear Friday, it's one of the best under-the-radar rivalries, the number one rivalry in the Metro mm-hmm. Atlantic, Manhattan at Iona here coming up Friday night. Uh, yeah. They'll probably lose by 30 points to a Manhattan team that I think they're better than despite blow blow on the comp yeah. the standings. Um, uh, and they also host Marist on Sunday. So, And then at Siena Wednesday, I guess they got three games in the next seven days here. Right. Uh, St. Peter's very quietly getting, you know, picking up a few wins as well. They are hosting yeah. Quinnipiac at Fairfield this week. But uh, if you're looking at who's going to win the conference regular season, the game to watch this week is the ones that I've highlighted right there. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. They all matter. They all they matter do. at this yeah. point. Get all, get all your screens out and put them side by side. Yeah. Uh, Mid American conference time and uh, and Rocco, you know, Akron had been off to a great start, had faltered a little bit, but came back last night, Tuesday night here with a very nice home win over Bowling Green. It was closer than that, I guess, 15 point final, but it was still a very nice win. Very nice win. Uh, Akron, yeah, as you mentioned, they were impressive during parts of the season, uh, getting their stride back. They had to really survive and struggle to beat Eastern Michigan. I think they won that by one point uh, yeah. over the weekend. Uh, and that must have springboarded them into a much more productive effort against a Bowling Green team that I think, quite frankly, gave all their energy to beating their rivals Toledo. I, I actually watched that game and um, – you know, even though Toledo's record's not as good this year, that has got a lot of heat in that game, uh, Battle of I-75. And Bowling Green hit a beautiful uh, game-winning shot to, to beat Toledo. But I think they came out a little flat against Akron in, in an equally as important game. Um, so now Akron's in control. Yeah, I agree with you, despite, I mean, technically half a game behind the series, but time in the loss column. Yeah. Uh, and, and you look at the West Division, you know, Central Michigan we were looking at, and that, now it's uh, Northern Illinois maybe on top. Uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, but this could be a crazy battle for only, f- the, especially for four teams will get buys into the quarterfinals here, and there's five, maybe a 17 battle for those for those top four seeds at the moment. Yeah, probably so. And again, the Mac uh, putting on the show that it always does a lot of good rivalries, uh, a lot of parody, uh, a lot of good teams have trouble getting through it. I mean, I know even uh, Buffalo, as good as they were a year ago, stumbled in a couple of conference games. Uh, mm-hmm. To, to kind of echo what Rocco said, if Akron can get out of this tournament and get into the field of 64. I think they're a potentially a dangerous team. They don't always play up to their ceiling. We've seen them lose some games that they probably could have won, but they are good. Yeah. They, they've got two tough road games this week at central Michigan at Western Michigan, but honestly, any road game in this conference is a tough road yeah, game. Yeah, tough road game yeah. Uh, yeah. You play at Miami, Ohio, you play at Eastern Michigan, the two worst records. They're still tough road games. So it's going to be a fun last few weeks here in the MAC, and I think it's going to be a real fun conference tournament at the end of the day. Oh, yeah, yeah and it top, always is. Getting in that top four, though, like you said, Chad, is the biggest thing this time of year, and I, mm-hmm. you know, there's so much at stake with, the, with those games going for the top four. I saw Ball State and Kent State last week, and uh, Taj Teague for Ball State, I mean, that guy is an unbelievable force. I think, I think any of these top five or six teams can really pose a threat, not just Akron in the NCAAs. Uh, Speaking David, of not posing a threat, yeah, yeah, David. A couple <laughs> weeks ago, we were, we we're all on Norfolk State. Last week, we were all over North Carolina A&T, who promptly lost a game badly at Florida A&M this week. Uh, in the MEAC now, North Carolina Central is suddenly our first place team. Uh, but uh, maybe it's just a question of does it matter because the team's going to go to Dayton and lose the first four games. Yeah, when you look at the net rankings, you see a remarkable, uh, <laughs> the, you know, two teams. Top 250 would be great. Yeah, know? two teams in the uh, in the top 250 barely 
Uh, and, and you, well, there is a lot of parity in this league. Uh, Maryland Eastern Shore, one of the storylines, kind of ruined their chances at winning the Centenary. You got to feel kind of bad for them. Uh, but um, Howard's in the Howard's in the running. Yeah, I, I still like NCA and T actually, even though that they're the third place team. But uh, well, like you said, nobody is really distinguishing themselves, and you kind of get the sense. And you hate to say this, but I don't know how else to put it that everything that basic they're they're not even playing for home court advantage or anything at least the nec is doing that everything that sort of happens is basically filler until the conference tournament well and the conference is played in norfolk rocco so that is the the advantage Mm -hmm. norfolk state will have when they get there whether the one two seed two seed three seed whatever right yeah and it seems like nc central over the last few years has played really well there for whatever reason Mm -hmm. um and and so them being in first will only help them get back to that championship game. Uh, int- another interesting note, I think, uh, happened right after last week's Under the Radar show. It happened on Thursday. North Carolina A&T announced that they're going to leave and go to the Big South. Yeah. Yes. And, and, then as, and then as soon as that announcement was made, <laughs> they proceeded to go from 8-1 and one and lose two straight, and now they're in the play. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and I got to give, give a shout-out to Howard here. One of the very rare things you see ever done, there are only 353 teams in Division One. Howard is currently ranked 354th in the KPI <laughs> ranking. Uh, yeah. Now, 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 the explanation is actually the KPI gives a ranking to all nine D1 teams as if they were a single one team, single team. But they are worse than that. They actually lost a non-D1 game to Washington Adventus this year. So uh, that's, right. uh, yeah, that's that, why they are beyond below non-D1 games. Teams that even. is <laughs> remarkable. Another thing, here we are the middle of February, or at least, well, maybe the first third of February, February 12th. And nobody has an overall winning record. Uh, twelve and twelve oh, overall for Morgan and NC Central, but against D one competition, all below five hundred. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got a couple that are at five hundred, no one above. So let's wow. let's pull up some Missouri Valley standings. A couple of score updates that did not quite hit the screen yet. Missouri State beat Drake tonight. Northern Iowa did pick up the win over Illinois State, a revenge game. Uh, that's it. That's not on the screen there, but right now. Northern Iowa now up to 11 and two overall. Yeah. So this team though, look at those standings though, David, AP poll 28th, coaches poll 28th. You and I wins this weekend. They may crack the top 25 in one of these polls next week. Uh, they might, if you look at the, they kind of did hit a wall. I know they only have two losses, but they had to sweat out some of those wins. And then like one of the losses was really bad. Although they avenged it tonight against Illinois state. Uh, my question is, does Northern Iowa, if they win out, go in on the first ballot? Yeah, at Loyola Chicago, real tough oh, yeah. game this this weekend. Yeah. But if they get that game, uh, it, Rocco, what what do you think? Do, do, does Northern I- how good is this Northern Iowa team? Where do they end up on the seed line if they win out? I I, I think definitely. Uh, I I've got them in as of right now inside the bubble by a few spots. Still in the 11 seed range, so not too far in, but a, above a couple of the first four teams uh, at this very moment. Um, but yeah, I think, I think their resume is holding up very well. Uh, the, the Colorado's resume is getting better. The better Colorado gets, it, it just seems to kind of bring them up and up and up. And now, as you mentioned, a, a win at Loyola gets another one in the Q2 belt. And then they'll go to Indiana State next uh, Tuesday, I believe. Or maybe it's next Wednesday. Um, and they will have another Q2 opportunity there because Indiana State's net is pretty decent. It's like 110 or yeah, it's next Thursday at Indiana State there, the 20th, according to the screen, at least. Uh, okay. Um, and, and the Southern Illinois game, albeit a home game, although I would note that as we record, the Southern Illinois yeah. is getting blasted at the halftime by Valparaiso uh, on the, oh, the wow. road. Oh, that's but, not a good team. Yeah, they lost. It's over now, Chad. Oh, it's they over. Lost, okay. They lost by 17. Yeah, but um, but I did want to give Southern Illinois a shout out. That was a snap to seven game winning streak. Uh, got them under third place. It's an unbelievable story. Brian Mullins, first-year head coach, come over from uh, being the associate coach under Porter Mosier at Loyola Chicago. Nobody, everybody picked them last to start the year, and here they are in third. So it's a pretty uh, awesome story. Yeah. And then uh, last note I have is Bradley just got Elijah Childs back, and they're, they're a very dangerous team going forward. They uh, took care of Indiana State tonight by 11, and uh, Childs is already back to full strength. He had 19 tonight. He had 26 over the weekend. Um, and you know Bradley won this tournament last year, so you got to keep your eye on the Braves. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, another awesome story is Evansville, but we've already talked about that. That's yeah. unbelievable. Uh, let's yeah. talk about a bigger, better story. Uh, <laughs> despite the fact that they suffered their first conference loss to Long Island over the weekend, Mary Mack, an eligible fan sailing tournament, first year, uh, it actually took a historic effort by Long Island uh, to, to break that, that Mary Mack record here. Uh, first of all, um, they had, what was it, Derek Kellogg picked up his 200th career win. They had a player set the NEC record for rebounds in a game with 27. Uh, uh, I believe, uh, I forget his name, but set, set the, the uh, teams, I'm not doing very good here, am I? The, the team's yeah. all-time record for, uh, for but, but Dave, David, Mary Mack did finally lose the game, although I guess it was... Uh, yeah, but it is a remarkable well, yeah. story, like you said, like setting a record, the, the most wins by a team ever in their first year of transition. Uh, they are eligible for a postseason tournament, probably the CIT. I, I would be really, really upset if, if they did not get invited to that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I don't believe they'll be participating in the conference tournament. But, uh, Chad, where did where, where our screen go? Well, Dave, Dave, why don't you tell us why they're not going to participate in the conference tournament? I'm trying to get the screen back here, Cordell. Okay. Like they were the trying to – well, again, like uh, a transitional team, it's a four-year transition, meaning you're not eligible for the NCAA or the NIT until you've completed it. So while they're practically D1, they're technically not full-blown D1 yet – Although I think that we, we're, we're going to fight this. Have, have we done this before, tried to get a team eligible that uh, wasn't? Uh, uh, I, don't, we, I think we kind of did it with Greg Cage. Didn't we oh, yeah, we did. Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't remember that. But we're, yeah, we're going, we're going to try and call the – I mean, they're, they're testifying before Congress today, but I'm sure they'll take our call. We uh, okay. to do let, let, let me correct this here. Over the weekend when Long Island beat Mary Mack, uh, Raekwon Clark for LIU Brooklyn, the – former Blackbirds, now the Sharks, set, yeah. became the, the school's all-time career scoring leader. In addition, Ty Flowers that game had 27 rebounds, an NEC all-time record in a single game, uh, breaking a record that dated back to the 80s. In addition, head coach Derek Kellogg, 200th career win. That's what it takes, Rocco, to beat Merrimack this season. <laughs> a triple historic game. <laughs> It was a heck of an effort. I got your email on that, and I uh, I read about it. It was pretty pretty amazing feat. And the Sharks were picked by a lot of people to win the the league preseason. So you got to keep your eye on them first year as the Sharks coming into the NEC tournament in a couple weeks. Right. Uh, but Robert Morris obviously two game lead now, and yeah, they are going to be the have the chance for the home court advantage throughout the conference tournament. Which uh, is but, awesome because they've got the new uh, brand new arena that I got to visit earlier this year. Yes. Very nice. Very nice new building there. Uh, it is. David, let's try to run through the rest of these conferences a little bit quicker here. We're starting to run out of time and I don't even know where we're at. What are we at? Ohio Valley conference, David, how about that? Uh, how about it? Uh, where, you, you know, it's coming up here. Uh, Maybe who knows? Uh, yeah. Forget it. Just talk about the OVC. Belmont. We'll get, so there we go. Uh, Murray State and Austin Peay both suffering losses over their first conference losses over the season. Austin Peay actually going 0-2 on the Belmont-Tennessee State trip. Yeah, uh, I, I was kind of a bigger believer in Austin Peay than Murray State. I still kind of am despite the two losses, but we'll see. The one thing is it's sort of a, a you know four-team race for the top two spots that buy into the semifinals. Four-team race for the top two spots. Three and four will make the quarterfinals. Top eight into the conference tournament. That's almost set at this point, though. Uh, two game yeah, lead there. Three for games three separating. It, yeah. yeah, those two. Um, uh, just real quick on Moorhead State, Chad. They got a really tough road to hold because everybody that they play for the rest of the way is ahead of them. So if anybody's going to slip up in that range, it might be them. It could be them. Uh, Jacksonville State's had a very disappointing season, though. Uh, yeah. But, Rocco, we get, finally get our first of two Murray State-Austin P games coming up to, uh, Thursday night here. Yeah, I think it's like two in the next three weeks. If yes. Not, yeah, they they play in the regular season finale as well. Should be, should be great. Um, I, I think each team should, needs to protect home court. Uh, we'll see how it plays out. That, like David mentioned, they're very they, – on paper, evenly matched. Um, Belmont able to beat both of them in a three-day span. So, Belmont back in the race as well. So, uh, I think it's a – Probably a three-horse race when it comes down to OVC tourney time, but we'll see. Uh, I think I think Belmont's got a real shot to make the top three after the sweep this weekend against uh, Murray and Austin P. 
Yeah, real odd. Uh, different. I mean, just real quick here, Chad. You notice tomorrow all the games are the travel partner games on a Thursday, which is kind of weird. But right, and anyway. then the, and then they've got a got a game on over the weekend as well. They, yeah. I think they kind of condensed the schedule a little bit. That, yeah, I think so. All right, uh, Rocco, I want to go to you for the Patriot League. I know you've got a few thoughts on this conference that uh, Colgate is now two games up in the standings on. Yeah, and Colgate, you know, real quickly, big win over BU to get that two game lead. That happened, I think, on Monday night. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, I think the, the potentially big story here is uh, the, probably the biggest, highest rec uh, rated recruit Patriot League history, uh, Santi Aldama from Spain. He was the U18 FIBA MVP last year of uh, the, all the Euro championships. He commits to Loyola, Maryland because he's a, uh, got a relationship with one of the assistant coaches. Very bizarre commitment. He, br uh, he, he busted his knee um, during the preseason. Hasn't played until three games ago. At that time, Loyola Maryland was one and eight in the league. They end up winning three straight with uh, with Santee in the lineup. Tonight was game four. They they did have a lead at American. Ended up falling short. Uh, but the fact that they're playing pretty toe to toe with American tonight shows that these guys could be a real wild card. We're gonna find out a ton on Sunday when Colgate visits Loyola with Santee in the in the lineup. I'm, I'm very intrigued by this this whole story though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it should be a good game. Um, and this is a conference where, even though the conference tournament is played on home courts of the yeah. higher-rated seats, it's yeah. wide open because we saw yeah. Holy Cross come out of the ninth yeah, That's right. Win four yeah, games right. on the road and win the After conference tournament. After not winning four conference games all year, winning <laughs> four in the conference tournament, and then winning in the first four game, I think. Anyway, so. Yeah, they did. Yeah. They played Kansas after that. I remember They that. did not win that one. No. Uh, they had a little trouble with Kansas yeah. that year by a <laughs> few hundred points. Um, David, the, uh, the Southern Conference, one of yeah. the best awesome. conferences out there. These top three teams all with top 75, well, se top 76 net rankings, I guess, if we want to be a little more technical here. Yeah. Uh, but re three really good teams. And I guess let me start with East Tennessee State, though, who did win at Mercer, getting the revenge off of their home loss. Uh Picked up the win over Citadel as well. Uh, ETSU, should they win out to the Southern Conference Championship game, which would include, uh, you know, three road wins, but not against – the only game against Furman or Greensboro left is a home game against Furman. They lose to Furman or Greensboro in the championship game. Can this team make the field? I, I think so. Now, I, I I think that they can. I'm not guaranteeing it, but I would at that point I would like to think that it's 75 them making it, 25 them not. The one thing that has me a little questioning that is that loss to Mercer, and maybe I'm reading too much right. between the lines, but when you see Kentucky not get a protected seed despite what's on the top of their profile, you have to know that they're looking at that Evansville game. Evansville – at the time they beat Kentucky was not as bad as this Mercer team is when, when they beat ETSU. So how much are they going to hone in on that? And what's so frustrating is that this East Tennessee state team on the court is a top 40 team. They had one bad night and that could, I hate the thought that that might be what keeps them outside the bubble because they, they, they you know, they wanted LSU, they wanted Greensboro, They've won at Western Carolina, who I know doesn't look there that good, but is tough at home. This is a team that, if they got into the tournament, could win a game in the round of 64. Right. And, and, and Rocco, yeah. we discussed the, uh, the fact that Liberty could not win at LSU. Here's a team that did win at LSU. They did what Liberty couldn't do. Not only did they do that, they did it by double digits. They yeah. dominated yeah. that game. I mean, it was, uh, it was a butt kicking out in Baton Rouge. And, yeah, I agree with everything David said. I, th I think 75-25 is more than – fair i think a couple good things have happened to etsu in the last week so not only did they pick up two road wins but since the start of last week they've jumped 13 spots in the net from 54th they're now 41 as this morning i think they might even go up more tomorrow because mercer just won at wofford today and that might go from q4 to q3 now because mercer's got another big win on the road um and uh, yeah, so this and, is, this and, is and i don't know that, that yeah, so circle this game february 26th at wofford uh wofford I think they've lost three times at home this year. I think they've lost since they opened that building about nine times overall total. It, it, they are very tough, tough at home. Uh, yeah. This. But go very ahead. tough. Yeah, and then next, you know, I, I know I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I think it is – actually, no, it's on next Wednesday. So, Furman's going to visit ETSU, perhaps the SoCon game of the year. We'll see. 
uh, uh, no promises, but I got a 50-50 chance I'm going to make it out there. I, I really oh, hope wow. I can work it out. Yeah. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, so, so let's – I mean, we'll take a look at that. I mean, Furman and Greensboro are both very tough teams. The, the key here, I think, is to finish that number one seed, though, because that way you yeah. only have to win a championship game against these top three Teams that finish the second, third are going to have to play each other in a semifinal and then probably come back and play the third team in the championship game yeah. unless mm -hmm. craziness ensues in this conference tournament. So that is one thing to really take a look forward for here in the last couple of weeks of the conference uh, regular season. And Furman is a really good team. I mean, they've got <laughs> yeah. experience. I mean, it's, I, I would just They are good. Players. I mean, most people – I love watching them. Yeah, I mean, they, they took Auburn to overtime. Yeah. And they had that one a few times. They just kind of yeah, yeah they did. It. They, they yeah. actually I don't want to say they blew it because that tends to overlook how well they played in that game. But they had the game. It, it, they were in a position to win the game and mm -hmm. should have arguably won it. Yep. Uh, over in the Southland Conference, Rocco, uh, as we record this, Stephen F. Austin is putting the finishing touches on the revenge game at Corpus Christi uh, off of their <laughs> lone conference loss, but they're blowing them out right now with about a minute left to go as, as I see it. Uh, but uh, SFA, good for them, I guess, turning around after having, having a few close calls at conference uh, as well. Yeah, good for them for doing it. The, they're playing tenacious defense like they did in non-conference. Uh, I think they're a dangerous team. Hopefully, uh, just for, you know, uh, the tournament's sake, it, it'd be great to get, see them in the NCAAs. I, I'd love to see them matched up against kind of anybody in that 13-4 uh, game or 12-5 game. Yeah, I'm thinking 13 See, I think 12 seed might be a bit of a stretch because they – look at that strength of schedule, 3-23. They, yeah. they played at Duke and won at Duke but yeah. didn't play anybody else. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's just a matter of – I think they're all – they don't have a horrible loss yet. So if they can get through without any more well, losses – Well, the Corpus might, Christi home jump. loss is pretty bad. Oh, I don't oh know. yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I don't know what, they have I don't one hard <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I forgot that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the upcoming schedule uh, after SFA finishes off Corpus Christi tonight, David, they've got uh, – let's see. They're hosting Central Arkansas next week. I think they're actually off over the weekend and then hosting Central yeah. Arkansas next Wednesday. Yeah, um, and I I think – I mean, they'll obviously be on the board and in the discussion, but I think that they need to win that conference tournament. This is I, the win mm -hmm. I agree. Now, there is a, there's a double buy here, so they're going to buy right into the semifinals. So right. They only have yeah. to win two games in Katy, Texas, on a neutral court. Mm -hmm. So – yeah, uh, against sub-200 teams. Oh, but they could end up with Sam Houston State in the, in the semifinals, which is their arch rival. So yep. that's yeah, the and they got to play the them. Circle. And they'll play them in the season finale, too, so that yeah. could be back-to-back -back matchups for, for them, at least. Yeah. Uh, David, the Southwestern Athletic Conference, where Prairie View – Comes a mm -hmm. comes away with a huge win against Texas Southern, uh, yeah. but uh, I I want to talk a little bit again about this Alabama State team. They were a little shorthanded most of the season. They picked up, uh, I think they were like one and five in conference at one point. They're up to six and five, very slowly moving up these standings here. Yeah, back at full strength and playing a lot better. And it, it again similar to some of the other leagues. There is not a whole lot going on between now and the end, other than filler. Well, I guess you could argue that the first place finish gets the NIT, but um, it's really going to come down to the conference tournament, which is already at a predetermined site. In Birmingham, so semi-home yeah. game for Alabama State, at least in their home state. Y yeah, I mean, you know, for them and A&M and – well, yeah, them and A&M can't even like, make the top yeah, eight and make it, it there. If I don't they know. Can't even make the top eight, which, which goes off. But yeah, Alabama State moving safely inside the SWAC bubble, so to speak. Now they <laughs> will have to go on the road uh, if this holds to what really it, Prairie View and Texas Southern as good as Grambling's been. I, I think those two are the class of the league. It wouldn't shock me at all if that was the championship game. But uh, yeah, like you said, Alabama State a much different team now. Yeah, they are hosting uh, in-state rival Alabama A&M this weekend. I think that's their only game in the next seven days for Alabama State. Prairie View in the meantime, uh, hosting Grambling and Jackson State. They should win. Uh, just a quick note, the conference are actually the first, the quarterfinals are played on campus sites. Yeah, so right. uh, big if Alabama State, if we are believing them, can get up to that third, third or fourth seed, which I think there is definitely time for them to be, move up there. Yeah. Uh, Rocco, the uh, yes. Sunbelt Conference. The Sun Belt. Uh, yes. Are you on the Little Rock bandwagon with me and David? 
I love the little Roccos. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm all the little Roccos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's no, they had, they had some really great teams when I was growing up, and I used to call them the little Roccos. So I'm bringing it back all these years later. Yes, <laughs> um, uh, but no, I've always I've always been a fan of that program. Um, Coach Walker's been tremendous this year. I cannot believe that they're 12 and two, and they just continue to win uh, all, by all means necessary. It's it's a really great story. I think um, if you want to talk about another team that's got the most momentum with a chance to knock them off, you got to look at this Texas State team. They played the best defense in conference play. They've won seven of their last nine, and they're going to play each other tomorrow. So um, I keep, keep your eye on, on the Bobcats of Texas State. But otherwise, the story is certainly little little rock. Yeah, I mean, David, I just wanted to go Georgia State all season in this conference, but I, I can't. They, they just keep yeah, losing I mean, games that they shouldn't be losing. Well, not after the Little Rockos. I mean, you know, how, how do you not like Little Rock after hearing that? Uh, yeah. Um, only the top 10 teams make this conference tournament. It looks like Monroe is on the verge of being eliminated, although it is a, I believe it's a 20-game conference regular season this year. Um, okay, yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, good, good battles for at least who that other team out is, Troy, Louisiana, Arlington, Coastal, uh, but uh, David, last conference for the night, the Western Athletic Conference, yep. and the only team in all these under, under the radar leagues that is undefeated in conference play is New Mexico State Aggies here. Yeah, with six games remaining, I got a three-game lead. They're running downhill. Four-game uh, lead I, over eligible teams, yeah. Yeah, four-game lead over eligible teams, so very close to clinching the first-place spot. Uh, I was mistaken. I, I thought that they had all their players back. They do not, but they're still dominating the league, and they're still potentially a dangerous NCAA tournament team. Uh, I, I would really like to see them do it. I, I don't – you know, when you look at what they did last year and you look at how they kind of blew it against Auburn, played a really good game, was in a position to win the game, and you got to figure that had they won that game against Auburn, they probably win the next one and walk into the Sweet 16. I'm not saying they would have gone to the Final Four like Auburn did, but they really could have put an exclamation. <laughs> David is putting New Mexico State in the they Final Four. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, they really – I mean, my point is that they, they were really, really good, and I don't think – anybody outside of us diehards really appreciated it as much as as much as they should have and you kind of wish that this class and everything that they've done you kind of hate that they've been riddled with injuries and you'd like to see them win at least one tournament game this is a team that traditionally has dominated the whack they've got a good regular season history but very very few ncaa tournament wins as a program Right, and there they are, Rocco. Uh, this week they're hosting Seattle and Utah Valley, um, yeah. and, and I think we got to very briefly mention here. Uh, I'm hearing rumors; nothing's confirmed yet that Dan Marley is on the hot seat at Grand Canyon, and I don't get it. Idiotic. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, you know, I was actually considering saving it for my final thought. But oh, I'm sorry, I jumped you there. Go no, ahead. that's okay. That's okay. So uh, they actually went to Cal Baptist and won over the weekend. I think that was a huge win for the – that's probably the, one of the best wins of the season. Uh, Cal, Cal Baptist has been fantastic at home, uh, selling out crowds. Uh, right. But a really cool story came out of that that I was reading about where uh, Cal Baptist actually modeled their program when they made the transition after all the success Grand Canyon had. And now there's a lot of um, – camaraderie going on between the two Dan Marley said nothing but great things about Cal Baptist Cal Baptist nothing but great things about uh, Grand Canyon and it's a really interesting background that Cal Baptist has I know that they were a team of the people a couple years ago but they actually only played D2 basketball for four years before yeah. that they were NAIA they, 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 had to, they had to delay their D1 transition by a year because you had to be a D2 for four for years four. Before, you could, <laughs> before you could move up to D1 so that's a <laughs> and they squeezed in a, a, yeah. an elite eight in D2 which is like the holy grail there so uh, yeah, it's a really interesting story, and, and it's paying off for Cal Baptist. You see pictures of these crowds, and it looks like a Grand Canyon game. So the WAC really building it from the ground up. And when they get Dixie State in and when they get Tarleton State in, those are like two towns where there's nothing going on but the, but the team. And I think they're going to get huge crowds in those towns. Yeah, in interesting. Future. Those two teams coming in, Bakersfield and Kansas and City, both on, their way, both on their way out. Bakersfield to the Big West, Big Kansas West. City to the Summit League. So mm-hmm. back to yeah. the Summit League where they'd been at one point. 
So we're oh. going to see some crazy home court advantages um, sooner than later uh, uh, on top of what we've already seen. Yeah. Uh, speaking of craziness, we just watched Georgia Tech beat Louisville, but that is not under yeah, the radar. So uh, 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 let's go to I've our top of, 10. I've never heard of those schools. So. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to our top 10 list uh, uh, for February 12th. We've got a few, bunch of honorable mentions here. Teams that got votes. Uh, our colleague John Slika did vote, even though he didn't bother showing up for tonight's show. Uh, yeah. But... Uh, um, <laughs> Teams that got votes but did not make the top ten include Winthrop, North Texas, Ooh. Bowling Green, Colgate, Wright State, Hofstra, and Merrimack. Merrimack, okay. uh, who I continue to vote for, but none of you do. Yeah, <laughs> they deserve to be number one in my opinion. Akron is our number ten team. Uh, Ooh, yeah, after the whatever Bowling rising. Green. Yeah, uh, Liberty at number nine, still hanging in there in the top. 10 just for more based on overall record i think than actual yeah. performance <laughs> and for monta team that's rising here uh, over the last few weeks up to number eight in our top 10 poll new mexico state we just discussed them as number seven yep yale exactly. number six a very good yale team uh yeah i, th- I think they'd be higher than this if they won that harvard game yeah oh for sure yeah uh, number five, we got UNC Greensboro, the third of those sub- Southern Conference teams. I think that tells us what's coming up next. Yeah, uh, Furman. Furman. This is Ed, a good Furman oh, team. Oh, Stephen F. Austin sneaking there at number three. Yeah. And there's East Tennessee State at number two. Mm-hmm. And and it, y- yeah. I, I don't think there's any surprise who the number one team is. They may not be on this list next week if they can crack the top 25, uh, but Northern Iowa, the number one team in our top uh, under the radar top 10 list. Yeah, and you know, East Ten- Northern Iowa inside the bubble, East Tennessee State on it. We might see both of them inside the bubble by the end of the year. Two really good teams. I guess that only went through any final thoughts, Rocco. Any other final thoughts for the evening? Uh, yeah, just one one last final thought on the Ivy League. Um, I was also, you know, doing some research on the Ivy, and most leagues today, and most scorers today are guard heavy. Uh, so you look at all league teams, you're looking to put like three guards on an all league team or maybe even four Ivy leagues, the exact opposite right now, the top four players in the league are all big men. And I think it's very unique. Uh, Paul Atkinson leading the charge for Yale. Uh, AJ Brodeur is an outstanding power forward for Penn. Uh, Jordan Bruner, who I mentioned earlier, uh, hopefully he gets back to health is the, is the secondary big man to Atkinson on Yale. They both are just having astronomical years. And Chris Knight for Dartmouth is putting up big numbers as well. Um, and I didn't even mention Princeton's Richmond uh, Arigazo. And I think he, that guy has got a really good touch on the ball. He's got a really great passer. Um, so when you turn on the Ivy League, it's going to be a lot different than most leagues when you're watching these teams because they, they are all, most of these teams are running their offense through their big man. Uh, so it's a little bit of a throwback, and it's kind of cool. Yeah, I like Ivy League hoops. I think it's a fun, real oh, yeah. fun conference to watch. And, and as we mentioned earlier, I think this Yale team is going to be dangerous, probably looking at the 12 seed if they can win the conference tournament, yeah, uh, especially, so, yeah. especially if we can find a way to keep Harvard out of that conference tournament. The games will be at Harvard's home court. So uh, Harvard doesn't make it. Yale's going to have a real clear path there. But David, let me let you finish out the show. Yeah, I'd kind of like to go back to the WAC, the last conference that we talked about. And just one of the things that has me scratching my head is Chicago State. I I don't understand how they can be in a basketball-centric, crazy location (laughs) with that is rich in high school talent. And I don't mean I don't expect them to compete with Illinois and DePaul and Wisconsin and like Marquette and all those. But you would expect them to get enough talent to be able to beat UMKC and some of the other teams or at least beat anybody. (laughs) I, I, I don't get like just by accident, shouldn't they be in the top 200 every now and then? I mean, this is a team that is perennially awful. How how far do you have to go back to count up their last t- ten Div One wins? It's many many years. Well, they, come on, David. They beat North Park this year. They beat Purdue Northwest this year. They beat Judson College this year. And actually, they won at SIU Edwardsville, which is actually yeah, yeah. Impressive. They did win at Edwardsville, which is <laughs> you know kind of remarkable. But like yeah, Belmont lost there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I I just don't. So, uh, so it, they they'd be in first place in the OVC then. Come on, David. Yeah, <laughs> they would. Maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe they need to move to the OVC. I, I, go ahead. I, I cut you off. <laughs> I, I'm just perplexed at how they're always. They're going to win the centenary again this year. What is this uh, their third one? Uh, they're, they're in the cat. They're in the running. I think Kennesaw State's pretty horrible as well. Oh yeah, so. yeah. Forget it. 
Uh, but on that note, I do want to thank everybody for joining us. We'll be back again. Actually, we'll be tomorrow night, we'll be doing a bracket rundown show, which should be oh, a ton yeah. of fun. Uh, more podcasts next week. Lots of content on the website. But on behalf of David Griggs down there, Rocco Miller, make sure you check him out at Bracketeer.org. I think you just put a bracket up today, was it, Rocco? Uh, yesterday. yesterday but we'll yesterday. have a new one on friday so new one on friday through. okay and uh, if you want to know who belongs in and who belongs out make sure you check that out as well but i'm chad sherwood david rocco the little roccos are uh, somewhere around right here i <laughs> <laughs> hope to get it real soon <laughs>